is the Mohegan Congregational Church. The story of this church is really the story of the survival of the Mohegan people here in Connecticut. The church was everything to the tribe, right up on top of Mohegan Hill. That was the roots of the Mohegans. This church, since it was built, has always been the hub of tribal activity. It's like the center of the universe to the Mohegan tribe. Everything starts here and radiates outward. This spot is on what is known as Mohegan Hill, on the very top of Mohegan Hill. And the Mohegan people settled around and about this hill. This is the heart of Mohegan country right here. Because the people who live on the land surrounding it are living on land that has never been owned by a non-Indian. This particular site has been a ceremonial site and continues to be a ceremonial site, and so it was an appropriate spot for the church to be placed. Sarah Landman Huntington Smith, an early 19th century Norwich resident and missionary, is still honored today by the Mohegan people. In 1827, Huntington realized that the impoverished and declining Mohegan tribe in Montville was in danger of being moved to another part of the country under the Indian Removal Act. Huntington set out to raise funds for a missionary school and a place of worship. Christianization meant that we would be allowed to stay. This church was the reason we weren't sent on a trail of tears the way many other Indian tribes were during the Indian reorganization period. Sarah Huntington joined together with three Indian women, Lucy Tantaquitchen, Tecumwes, Lucy Ockham Tantaquitchen, and Cynthia Hoskett, who gave the land for this church uh, to build a church and a school. And it was said that this young woman rode on horseback from Norwich, which was six miles away, into the unknown to teach the Mohegans. And she would find them by listening for the sound of their axes in the wood. In 1827, Huntington started a school near the present church site in a Mohegan tribal member's homestead. The church was founded in 1831 with four members that first year, three non-Indian and one Mohegan. We owe a great deal to her because of her actions and the actions of the three Indian women, we were allowed to stay and maintain this as our home. This church has served and continues to serve as a site for Christian ceremonies and for Mohegan religious ceremonies. There is an eagle feather that's above the podium here in the church, and we have had pipe ceremonies. 30 years after its founding, support for the Mohegan church was greatly enhanced by the efforts of tribal member Emma Baker. She had a vision of her mother telling her to revive the Green Corn Festival as a way to maintain ancient tribal religious practices and also to support the small church. Emma Fielding Baker was a remarkable woman and served as a spokeswoman for the Mohegan on, on many occasions. In the 1860s, as head of the Lady Sewing Society, which met here, Emma Fielding Baker was extremely active in preserving the church. And the Women's Sewing Society really effectively ran the tribe. Emma Baker and the Lady Sewing Society revived the festival in 1861 on the church grounds. In ancient times, the ceremony had been held under a giant chestnut tree on the site of the present church. There was a brush arbor that was built about the church. Things were sold, food was sold, Mohegan arts and crafts were sold there. Tribal medicine woman Gladys Tantaquidgen remembers the times that she spent as a young girl with tribal members as they planned the yearly Green Corn Festival. And through the uh, winter months, the men and women would be busy uh, making the baskets and doing all kinds of handwork, making items that they would have for sale. This uh, annual Green Corn Festival was homecoming for many of our uh, Mohegan people and uh, visitors from all over the country. So it was quite an occasion for them to come and, and meet some of our uh, people and, and uh, have a chance to 
have some good Mohegan made succotash, the corn and beans, and, and the men would uh, go clamming and get clams, and then they'd make their own clam chowder. And uh, women, uh, they made their own bread and cake and things like that. And it was really uh, what we look forward to as children growing up. It was part of the religious life of the Mohegan of giving thanks at that time. And so it has continued to be an important part of Mohegan life. Through the early years of the 20th century, the church, now the last remaining Mohegan reservation land, continued to be a focal point for the tribe. Well, I remember coming at night, and then they had kerosene lamps, and the was very smoky. And I remember putting pennies when they made up the collection. I put my penny in the collection box. There wasn't too many people here then. And sometimes if it was too cold in the church here, it was held down in Schultz's house, which is right down here where my brother lives. Where the Mohegan church is, there is a field. There was a field when we were growing up. We called it the Grove. And we as kids used to play there a lot. We used to play baseball up there in the field play games in the field, hide and seek. Uh, it's right opposite the Mohegan Church where we used to go to church every Sunday. I used to play the organ and it was the old bellows organ, you know, you had to push all these buttons, not like today. But we were all very closely connected on the hill. It was like we were all brothers and sisters on the hill. The church membership was never large. In the early 20th century, membership peaked at about 125 members, evenly split between Mohegan and non-Mohegan. In the 1930s and 40s, membership had dwindled and the building was showing signs of its age. In 1946, the church closed its doors for 10 years. In the early 1950s, tribal chairman Cortland Fowler led a campaign to restore the old church. At this point, the church had fallen into serious disrepair and really couldn't be considered safe uh, for services. He spearheaded the effort to bring the church back and donated the pulpit and the eagle feather that hangs above the pulpit. The eagle feather stands as a symbol of determination for the tribal members to persevere and retain the spirit of this church. Right from the start, this church has been a mixture of, of Indians and non-Indians, and it is to the present. Um, the members are about 50-50 and uh, have been right through the, the times. Everything starts here and radiates outward. We're right on the top of Mohegan Hill. It's a very sacred place to the Mohegan Indian. And my wife is a uh, Sunday school teacher here, and my family attends church. And um, this is the center of the universe for the Mohegan. In 1994, the Mohegan tribe received official federal recognition, which led to the tribe's resurgence, in no small part due to the continued existence of the Mohegan church. We absolutely would not have gotten federal recognition had the Mohegan church not been reservation land here. This is the one piece of land that was maintained continuously as reservation, and we needed to have Indian land in order to establish continuity. When we received federal recognition, first thing we did was to come up here and joyously ring the bell. The church has been extremely important to what is at the heart and what is at the core of Mohegan. In 1998, with funds generated by its extraordinarily successful Mohegan Sun Resort, the Mohegan tribe began a massive restoration of its church. Today, the Mohegan church stands fully restored and expanded, a perfect symbol of the long history of the Mohegan people and their place in the local community, an enduring landmark on a sacred hill.